All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's, uh, let's jump in, why don't we? Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar on double materiality in practice. My name is Seth Foreman. I'm the CEO at Social Suite, and I'm going to move into the next slide here. So for those unfamiliar with Social Suite, we're a global sustainability and impact technology company specializing in materiality software. Um, I do want to review a couple of housekeeping items before we begin uh, the webinar. Uh, one is that the content of the webinar will last approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll hold about, uh, um, about a 15 minute Q&A session. If you do have any questions or comments as we go through the webinar on the right hand side, feel free to um, add any of your questions and comments there. Our panelists during the webinar um, may actually address those questions during the webinar or we'll get to them during the Q&A session. We will be recording today's webinar um, and we're going to distribute the recording a few days after, um, after we, we wrap up today. Now, let's jump in and meet our panelists. Um, now, one thing that we're fortunate about today is that we actually have quite a global set of panelists. Um, we have Tim calling in from Melbourne, Australia, Wes from Toronto, Canada, Emmanuel calling in from London, England. So it's quite a global perspective in terms of the content today. But Tim, why don't you start us off and if you can introduce yourself. Excellent. Thanks, Seth, and, um, and welcome, everyone. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Social Suite. And um, I've, I've about 15 years experience really working globally um, with companies large and small on sustainability. And previously, we're talking about corporate social responsibility, really in that area, helping companies think about strategy, move that into like a roadmap for what to do to improve your practices, and then understand how can you report that and share that with your stakeholders. So I've been doing that for a long time. And now it's really a pleasure to work with all these companies globally and work with experts as well to bring all that knowledge to you know, a growing body of, of corporates that really want to better understand how they can improve their sustainability practices. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Um, over over to you, Wes. Cause I, and Emmanuel, are you, um, I don't know if you had connection issues. Are yes. you all good? Can everyone hear and see me now? I got booted out You're for good. a moment, but I'm back. <laughs> yeah, why don't, you, why don't you keep going and uh, if you could introduce yourself, then we'll move on to Wes. Yeah, absolutely happy to be here. I'm Emmanuel Palacuccia, the head of sustainability advisory with Alliance Advisors. We are a global shareholder engagement, investor intelligence and corporate advisory firm. So in my role, I lead our sustainability solutions where we assist companies in developing best practice uh, ESG related reporting and and broader strategies to align with their stakeholder expectations. And over to you, Wes. Great. Um, my name is Wesley Gee. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Works Design. We're a design communications agency based in Toronto. Often we're involved in helping companies develop their corporate reporting, uh, annual reports, proxies, sustainability, integrated reporting. But an important step early in the process uh, often involves us assessing materiality uh, getting a sense of what matters most within organizations and beyond figuring out what those topics are, what does it mean in terms of the type of goals, the type of story that they want to tell, and how they might be able to align with important disclosure objectives. Perfect. Well, I'm going to pass the uh, baton over to Tim to take everybody through the rest of the content, and I'll be back on during the Q&A session. Excellent. Thanks, Seth. Um, and welcome, Emmanuel West. It's great to have you here today um, to look at double materiality and with that qualifier in practice. So if you look online, there's a lot of information already, a lot of theoretical information about materiality and sustainability, about double materiality. So today we do want to look at three key components at the why, uh, at the what and the how of materiality, but really the majority of our time will go to that how, making it practical. Um, the why and what are important, a little bit set that scene there, but I think you probably have heard a lot already about, you know, why materiality is important in that sustainability journey. Um, we'll talk about what materiality is and double materiality, but we'll keep that very brief because it's really important to understand that process of how can you go through a materiality assessment and what are some of those pitfalls there? 
Um, that is the core of today. We'll unpack six of those real challenges that you can run into, sometimes even unaware. So we'll go through that. And at the end of that, we'll have that Q&A. So if there are any questions throughout, like Seth said, please put them in the chat. We'll see if we can jump straight in or we'll um, try to answer them at the end. So first off, materiality is really important to understand that. Um, the concept of materiality is really about the importance of an item of information to your decision maker. So how relevant is it? And at what point does it cross a certain threshold that we've set as an organization that it becomes material? So in the context of sustainability reporting, it often refers to two components. There is the financial performance of a company, and then we're looking more at the, the risks and opportunities. So how is a company's enterprise value affected by particular sustainability matters? But there's also the flip side there, and that is how is this particular company impacting the world at large? So think about environment, society, people, the planet. So there's in sustainability, really those two perspectives on it. Um, why is it now so important in that sustainability journey? I think Wes, you already flagged that there, um, you know, starting out with, you know, working out, you know, what is actually relevant. So um, can you maybe both, and I'll start with you, Wes, address in your day-to-day -day practice, how do you use that concept of materiality working with, you know, with your clients? Um, it's it's interesting because, you know, I know that there are a lot of consultancies that specialize in just providing consulting services. For us, we have a subset of our team that are focused on sustainability. So there's actually a lot of fascinating things that you can learn from a materiality assessment um, and flank, frankly, that clients can learn about themselves. Um, and so a lot of what is learned, for instance, by engaging with those within and outside of an organization like investors or 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 uh, major clients or partners um, really ties quite well into developing that narrative around the organization around why do they exist? Who do they serve? What are the issues that matter most to others and framing it from other people's points of view rather than just from their own. Um, so, you know, some of the deliverables that come out of this are of course uh, a report, but broadly uh, a better understanding of how people actually want to be informed and engaged and how to be able to frame things kind of from, from their perspective. That, that's one uh, little tidbit, I guess. Oh, wonderful. That, that's a really good start. And already I see that, that, that whole, you know, your stakeholders and stakeholder engagement shining through there. It's really important. We'll pick up on that later. Emmanuel, same question for you in your day-to-day -day practice. Like, what is that role of materiality? Yeah, we at Alliance Advisors support companies across the uh, life cycle of a sustainability strategy. So reporting and crafting the narrative is obviously a, a really important piece of that. But I think starting from the beginning, materiality really underpins the entire approach that a company should be taking to its strategy development, to its reporting, uh, and to its prioritization of, uh, you know, focus areas and target setting. So materiality really should be a first step in the process. And uh, we really use it to help companies navigate, again, not only how they're reporting to best communicate to their stakeholders, but how they're aligning with a lot of the emerging regulation that does require this lens of what is material to your company, how material is this to your company in order to determine what you're reporting. So uh, we really walk companies through that conversation of what is what is most important to your company. Relevant um, and important are key, but also, how should you then prioritize what you're doing? How can we best allocate resources based on, on what is that top priority across uh, internal and external stakeholders? So, I mean, at the risk of, of uh, sounding a bit dramatic, I think materiality is everything, truth be told, when it comes to sustainability. It's such a, such a beautiful way to start the webinar. It is, it is. And I think that's what, what comes out of what you're saying here is it truly really is the cornerstone of your sustainability journey, so to say, and your annual reporting process as well. But there's a lot more in there, like West Flag, strategic, and to your point, resourcing and, and thinking about capacity building. You also flagged that, um, I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of legislation either incoming or that we're facing now these days. And um, one of them, in particular in Europe, the Corporate Reporting, um, Sustainability Reporting Directive um, and ESRS makes double materiality for that matter, a key component, a requirement of your 
you know, your sustainability reporting and engagement there. So a lot of people still wonder, like, what is that double materiality? Um, it is effectively, so we'll pick up on that briefly here. Um, it is effectively those two perspectives I've just flagged in that definition of materiality. It is trying to not just look at one side of the perspective and is only, for instance, only worrying about how is the world impacting my business, which is often traditionally seen as that investor focus. Investors are really worried about like, what is the bottom line of your business? What is the enterprise value? What is affecting the financial performance of your business? So that is important, the risk and opportunities your business is facing. So financial materiality, but there's more to it. And that is the flip side there. And I think that is not really what's coming out that a lot more organizations are starting to think about that. It's the core focus of the global reporting initiative. When you do materiality assessment with them, they really focus on, well, really, what is the impact you're having? So the flip side there, that is looking at how is your organization actually impacting you know, people or planets, society, the environment, but taking both those perspectives and looking at both of them in a materiality assessment, that's what we tend to call double materiality. Now, the question then is, that sounds great in theory, but how do you do that in practice? And that is a little bit of a tricky point still because ask a hundred consultants and you get a hundred different journeys, different slides that look somewhat like this, but everyone has their own view of what's in, what's out, how many phases, how many steps, how many subcomponents, what order it's in. So today we're not, don't want to run you entirely to each key component in here of how we as social should look at the double materiality assessment at the journey. But what we want to do is bring it back a step and take that step back and think about, yes, you can instrument this in a lot of ways, this journey, but what are some of the key pitfalls that you'll run into one way or another, whether you did that, you know, as the very first thing or as the second part in that journey, think about this to make sure that you don't, you know, run into it and how can you approach that? So I'm not going to go into this in detail. We recently did a webinar that fully unpacked this. So if you're really interested in that, you can find that, find that link or we can share that with you. But what we want to do is take this and go through that journey at a higher level and really look at those pitfalls. Before we do so, um, from both of you, any views on, you know, I think we've seen that the terminology double materiality really emerging in the last year or so um, in practice. Um, is it changing a lot of how you in your engagement with, with companies you work with? Are people worried about double materiality? Is there a level of understanding? Um, where do you see things going? So Emmanuel, can I start with you on that? Yeah, absolutely. The conversation has very much shifted toward double materiality. Even uh, at Alliance, we work with companies of all sizes, all industries. So even some of the smaller cap companies that just operate within North America and aren't subject to the, the CSRD regulations in the EU are looking at aligning with best practice and, and adopting double materiality. So the, the discussion has absolutely shifted that way. And I think it's more in line with the way that sustainability should be viewed as a whole, because it really is not a silo of just what are the outside in financial impacts on the company, but what are the potential areas that the company can impact stakeholders. I think that shift also reflects that ESG or sustainability is not just about risk and opportunity, it can be about value creation as well. And that view of impact materiality, the inside out, allows for more of that. So overall, just a really, I think, positive shift, despite some of the challenges that are going to happen as we adopt it and try to really understand what the best practices and requirements are around it. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, go ahead, please, Tim. <laughs> I was going to say, just building off of what Emmanuel was saying, you know, I, I find that I'm, I'm delighted that double materiality is getting us beyond the paradigm of just importance um, by, you know, uh, getting people to think a bit more specifically about the areas that might significantly impact the company and, uh, you know, where the company can make significant impacts on, on the communities where they operate and, and on the environment. Like it's impact is one of those um, it's a tough concept for people to be able to evaluate and, and just definitely not an area that, that everybody should be asked to comment on because, you know, impact is a hard thing to conceptualize uh, sometimes or, or to really kind of understand. Um, but it's one that we should start to collectively understand, even if what we currently perceive to be impact is far from perfect. 
Um, so, you know, the, the, like the idea, the intent to understand and address the impact even before knowing any absolutes is, is kind of part of the fun. Um, and, and by like focusing on impact, we can make it clear that this undertaking of ma double materiality is intended to feed into strategic planning um, and result in focused and, and likely ambitious outcomes too, so that they're not just focused on how to do a little bit better bit by bit. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll get into the pitfalls here, but certainly one, one area is, you know, really thinking about, you know, what are the goals that you want to, achieve, to uh, establish based on what is material so that we're not just getting into this incrementalism that really doesn't bring any joy um, and does, you know, I think that this is a great opportunity to engage people, um, to bring them a part of the, make them feel like they're part of the conversation um, and to collectively think about um, how to do this in a way that really makes the business better. No, both great insights. And I think, you know, bottom line here, like sounds like, don't see it as this, I have to do this tick box compliance exercise of double materiality, but really look at what's the value I can get out of this this exercise and you know is it an exercise or is it a fundamental component of who we are as a company to, you know, as you flagged earlier what's our purpose and what's our value proposition how can these that really uncover that and the impact we're having both positive and negative and any risks and opportunities associated with that so with that let's let's make it as practical as we can then and looking at some of those you know, the pitfalls that you can run into doing a materiality assessment. Like I said, there's many shapes and forms and ways you can do it. The European CSRD legislation gives you a, a framework of how you can approach it, but there's still a lot of, in that framework, a lot of the how that you need to figure out as a company, how you're actually going to do that in practice. So the six components we want to talk about today are that value proposition. So we'll definitely get back to that. Um, setting expectations, really thinking about, um, you know, the routine you're in and how you're going to approach this, something that we call the captain's call, we'll get to that uh, in a moment, um, thinking about your stakeholder voices and your data representation and how do you weigh that, and then I think that point we just flagged, like, you know, avoid ticking the box, but what should you be thinking about instead? So six things to keep in mind, we'll unpack each one of them uh, in order. So for that first one there, and I think you know, you just spoke about this, Wes, that, that value proposition there. We um, we tend to see still a lot of companies have a very kind of narrow kind of focus there. Um, they need to, they know they need to do this. They see it as a requirement for one reason or another. And they potentially go into this not fully informed about what they're doing and what the value is they can get. Um, can you start unpacking that a bit more, The I, I guess, the, the pitfall, but also really what should you be looking at? Yeah, I think that sometimes um, teams will get requests from a senior executive or a board member to conduct a materiality assessment because they see it as being just something that directly pertains to their ESG disclosures. Um, whereas, you know, of course, there's so much more that can be learned and, and benefited from, from this um, exercise. Um, so, you know, really, uh, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to, to first kind of have a discussion uh, with with your company, or in my case, with a client, to be able to better understand what are some of the objectives that we can achieve with this, so that this isn't a box ticking exercise, that it's one where people are going to want to be a part of this exercise and actively contribute toward it, um, so that it does feel rewarding. Um, and so, you know, having that discussion at the beginning, you know, uh, in addition to understanding the process that's involved in doing it, um, you know, really trying to understand what is the intent around this exercise while this will ultimately lead to better corporate reporting because you're focusing on what matters most and you're identifying steps that you can take to strengthen your house and to measure what matters and to be able to engage and provide capacity building effectively that just happens to be the the end uh, and and one of the outcomes that comes you know stronger reporting but to be able to see this as an opportunity for a company to learn more about itself, about its stakeholders, to really gain a current perspective on what matters most to different groups and why. And even if imperfect, an understanding of impacts, you know, what is, to what extent can an organization uh, make impacts externally and the extent to which uh, topics may uh, impact uh, a company uh, financially or otherwise. Um, you know, that's, 
those those are important discoveries that I think if people understand that, it might maybe make some people a little bit nervous who are used to being in this space, but it'll excite them at the same time. Yeah, no, it's great. And I think that's really where we see this, you know, we see the value of doing a materiality assessment move to. Emmanuel, um, you already you earlier flagged, I think some of the other components there around like that, you know, re thinking about resourcing and like, what do you need in your business? Um, do you have any further thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think Wes mentioned the the end result or the outcome. And I think that's an interesting point because oftentimes when we look at the materiality assessment process, I think even on, you know, maybe our, our earlier slide, step four, the final step is report, right? We have the final report, here are the findings, understanding the priorities, but in some ways that's actually just the beginning, right? Once the assessment is done, all of the value comes from the validation workshop that's done between either within a company or with a client and their, their advisor, their consultant, to understand how those findings can feed into target setting, feed into strategy development, and should, again, underpin everything that, that kind of comes from, from moving forward. Um, I think just one of the other maybe connected pitfalls to, to highlight here as we're talking about what happens after the assessment is, is conducted, is also communicating back to your stakeholders. So we often mm -hmm. talk about reporting and publishing your report, informing stakeholders through that way. But how many times have we or other stakeholders received surveys, taken the survey, and then heard nothing about it? Communicating back, engaging with your stakeholders and saying, hey, here are some of the, the ways that we have taken those findings and are, you know, using them moving forward to develop our strategy and we heard your feedback and we're, we're taking these steps uh, is, is just super important um, and, and more important in that communication rather than just the, the annual reporting, I think. So uh, the, the main takeaway there, once again, is the end of the materiality assessment is really just the beginning in a lot of ways when it comes to the way that it can help to prioritize strategy and resources. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And, and that's exactly how we see it. The, the end of the materiality assessment is the start of your, your sustainability journey for that matter. It informs so much. And that's why we really caution people not to see this as a, you know, an exercise happening in a, in a vacuum that you can shelf and tick the box and say it's done because you miss out on all the value. You've gone through an exercise, but the real value comes in how are you going to use these insights in, in all those areas that you both just mentioned. So, with that then, so if you've decided and you, know, you set up the scope, you are going to do this work, then sometimes you, you really kind of struggle with some unrealistic expectations there where teams might be really kind of pressured to do this exercise quickly within a certain timeline or really lack that level of education within the business, what it actually is. So again, this is really there's still that startup and setup phase there where you go through what are we doing here? What is this exercise, exercise and how does it work? Um, and really getting internal alignment on you know what is a materiality assessment and going through those, what can you get out of it? But also, what are some of the things that you really need to deliver a, a good materiality assessment? So, Emmanuel, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what how do you see that pitfall and how can people potentially start avoiding that? I think education is an important starting point. Uh, anecdotally, I had a, a client recently that said our, our GC wants us to do a materiality assessment before we publish our next report. Can we do that in the next two weeks? I was like, um, maybe not. I don't know that we're going to get the value out of it that we want by rushing that process, but let's talk about it. Let's go back to our GC and, and explain why we can't do it and why it's not going to suit you to try to rush this process because it's not a check the box exercise. So I think that is so crucial in getting that alignment, getting that buy-in. And then one of the other things just in terms of timing is not rushing through the beginning. I think setting that framework is so important from the get-go. And one of our, our items here is, you know, involving executives and other experts to validate topics. What you choose to assess through the materiality assessment process should take a fairly decent amount of time. It's not just pulling a few topics. And this is really an area where CSRD has 
even more clearly defined what that process looks like. Matching up some of the topics that you're assessing with the ESRS standards is a fundamental part of a double materiality assessment. So that requires a lot of work to define the topics, the subtopics, how, you're def how you are actually defining them, not just identifying them. So taking your time at the beginning to ensure that you're setting yourself up for success uh, is, is such an important part of the process. You can't rush into it. Um, Otherwise, it won't it won't create the value that you want it to. West thoughts on this as well. Yeah, um, you know, I guess you know when when you get these asks that are coming from from up high uh, for a uh, double materiality assessment, I think it is that that education component is important. So it's like just kind of making sure they have an understanding of what is involved in actually doing this and the type of information that's important to gather uh, both. Uh, let's call it objective and subjective information. And after explaining that, do they still want to do a double materiality assessment? Because this is, you know, not for the faint of heart. Uh, I would say I'm I'm really grateful that there are there's guidance from organizations like EFRAG. To my knowledge, the first really comprehensive breakdown of how one would do this type of assessment. And and I, and I would think of it as guidance rather than thou must follow the letter of the law of EFRAG. Um, but, you know, it, I'm, I'm happy to see that there is that type of guidance that is in place that, that people can see and, and essentially um, align to, um, but perhaps in some cases to kind of pick the things that they believe that they can accomplish rather than doing every single aspect of it. Um, and then after that, really walking through from a timing standpoint, okay, this is roughly how long it's going to take. If we're thinking about process in terms of identify, prioritize, validate, for instance, um, you know, these are these are what we suggest as the steps, how we might choose to uh, do an industry analysis, how we might choose to engage with others through different tactics and, and, and timing. Um, and, you know, to, to understand, you know, as, as Manuel said, this is not a two week process. It's probably somewhere closer to three to four months, for instance, sometimes even longer, depending on the complexity of and uh, of the organization, um, how far we want to get into, for instance, regionally significant issues versus something that's really for, for the organization as a whole. And one thing a little bit different to think about is, you know, for organizations that don't yet have a sustainability report or a disclosure, they might want to think about actually creating a report first before doing their first materiality assessment. And the reason why I suggest that is that um, that way people like stakeholders who you're engaging are going to have a frame of reference. They're going to have a, a general understanding of what are some of the things that you do seem to be doing or focused on uh, or, or committed to um, so that when they are being asked to uh, comment on um, the extent to which you're addressing different issues or around the uh, relative uh, impact of, of certain areas, then they might be able to act, actually have something like that of a, of a reference point. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, those are a few. I think, I, yeah, I think so sharing that. And I think so really these first two pitfalls are really demonstrating that there's a lot happening in that early phase. Really think about the value proposition, getting the right team in place. Um, and, and I think in that, um, in that first phase as well, it's thinking about like, how are we gonna go about this? And I think to your point, there's you know, some, some good guidance now out there, uh, relatively new still, there's still a lot of like the world is still figuring out how to do this in practice, run a good double materiality assessment. Uh, no one has like fully nailed it yet, I believe, but like there's some good examples um, uh, emerging, but there's still a lot of like more, let's say traditionally focused ways of doing this, just looking at, what is important, asking stakeholders pretty simple questions, just you know, rank the topics and that's the end of it. So I think it's really important here that you think about how we're gonna do this rather than just relying on, you know, a third party that says, oh, we've we've got you know a way that I've been doing for 20 years, that should be right. Um, do you do you see that move here, Wes, in, in your in your practice? Is there a, a, a clear kind of you see a clear line now where there's an old approach and a new approach, or is that really kind of merging and evolving over time? It depends on what an organization has done before, but yeah, there is more or less kind of like an old approach and a new approach. Like I, I really hope that there are some questions that were asked previously that we can also ask again to see if there are some changes over time. But I think we have to make sure that we're not taking the lazy approach of just kind of doing a slightly better version this coming year if, if, if it is really important to the organization that it 
focuses on a double materiality and to be able to gain access to information that maybe we didn't have access to before, you know, certain resources beyond an MDNA publicly available list of broad risks, but to be able to access a risk registry, for instance, um, that may give a sense of when it, you know, in terms of traditional materiality, uh, let's say, what are some topics that have been identified and, and evaluated based on the probability of, of, of negative events, uh, the severity of them. Um, so, you know, companies aren't always willing to share that kind of stuff because that's, you know, that's inside baseball, um, especially for large multinational organizations. So, yeah, yeah, the, that's, um, it, it is quite different. And having that level of education and securing that level of willingness to be able to pursue double materiality in a certain way is, is really important to secure early on. Otherwise, you might really face some challenges down the road because of a misunderstanding. Yeah. Other component that there's a lot of questions around always is around stakeholder engagement. How do you do that? And mostly when do you do that? And I think there's a, there's a little bit of, you know, thinking around that different views on that. I found it quite surprising that it's um, it's not highly emphasized in the, the CSRD and ESRS kind of, you know, approach to double materiality. It's, it's flagged. Apparently, there was some internal disagreement about how to do that. So they pushed it back now to companies to work out. So Emmanuel, what are you, some of your thoughts around stakeholder engagement in that process going forward towards doing double materiality assessments? Yeah, I was going to mention when we were talking about the the EFRAG or AFRAG, however you pronounce it, guidance earlier, that while it is kind of the most comprehensive view that we have to date, there's still a lot of questions that it leaves. They mm -hmm. mention that you should engage stakeholders, but doesn't necessarily define who. Mm -hmm. Impact versus financial materiality is defined, but we're not really told how we ask those questions or how we parse out financial versus impact materiality in our surveys or in our interviews with stakeholders. So that's really where a lot of the challenges for navigating this comes up. I think in terms of stakeholder engagement, it's a best practice that all companies should be doing. Again, at, at Alliance Advisors, we support companies with their uh, shareholder engagement, both during their annual meeting and off season. And we talk about the importance of building those relationships. But that isn't limited to shareholders. That is is extended to stakeholders and having this process be a really key tool for engaging with stakeholders is it's just a great opportunity to have that that time of year or time every couple of years where you do reach out and and uh you know engage with stakeholders and so that point we have here about considering using surveys and interviews surveys are great for quantitative data to serve as inputs for the materiality assessment but interviews are where you get the nuance. Interviews are where you get to have that discussion, build those relationships. So what I would drive home here is there are some key stakeholder groups that should likely always be part of a materiality assessment, investors, employees, customers, share or, um, suppliers rather, but it should be on a company by company basis, really looking at who who's key to us. If you're you know, a telecom company, maybe including media is an important component of that. So there's always going to be that company specific view, um, but it should just be looked at as a really meaningful opportunity to engage with stakeholders and um, should be done as robustly as, as possible. Yeah, I think that we should really make, make, make sure that there's a certain amount of stakeholder mapping at the beginning. Yeah. So that... Yeah companies will be able to evaluate stakeholder groups based on the extent to which they may be impacted by the company, the extent to which they may be uh, in, uh, they may influence a company. Um, and this is a practical point, but if you're actually trying to reach out to uh, different organizations or groups, like identifying more than one person within those organizations, because odds are somebody's on holiday, somebody's busy, you know, odds are it's, it's better to get two responses from an organization rather than none. Um, but I, I agree with Emmanuel, like um, surveys kind of give you the what and the the interviews kind of give you the why and the how. Um, and it really helps to kind of get into an understanding of like, what are some potential next steps? Why is it that you believe that, that this organization is 
underperforming compared to its peers? Now, that's not a materiality question, but while you do have their attention, you should be asking certain questions like that to, to, to gain a sense of, of um, you know, a, a reputation, let's say. Um, yeah, I guess I guess those are those are a few thoughts around this. But I guess the the other thing as well is is um, I'm I'm actually kind of happy that uh, Freg or Efreg um, doesn't tell you what questions to ask because I really don't want a standard setter to be to be trying to put things into plain English. That's not their job. It's it's their job to provide technical language, and I would rather be the organiz the 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 consultant or if I'm an in house to be crafting uh, questions based on how I feel like I can connect to others. Um, as long as I'm being really clear about what I'm trying to get them to respond to with respect to impact or in defining certain terms that are that I'm uh, identifying at the at the early stage that that ultimately are kind of going through that that funnel. Yeah, that, no, thanks. Thanks for that. And I think what we see here is that that whole stakeholder engagement component is really important. And I would really stress to make sure that it's across the entire process that you don't just allocate a small component where you go out and do a few surveys or interviews, but think about, you know, stakeholders are internal as well and make sure you take your, you know, cross-sectional team of people that work with you on this exercise from that starting point that we spoke about earlier, all the way through. So really engage and don't be the, you know, the lone ranger running the materiality assessment, but really see your internal team as your key stakeholders as well. Tim, I just want to add one very small point too, because I mean, one learning point from earlier materiality assessments is companies often get really pumped about engaging with quote unquote experts. Um, and I feel like that's a pitfall. And it was a point that was made in there just because sometimes it's just really cool to reach out to an expert for their opinion on something, but they may actually know very little about your organization or have any vested interest in the success of it. Um, so I would minimize the number of quote unquote experts you're reaching out to, unless you already have a relationship or, or they're already known to have an understanding about your organization. Otherwise, they don't really have skin in the game. Um, and you might hear a lot of cool stuff, um, but it may not be contextually relevant to your company. Sorry, I'll let you no, go. No, great, it's a, th that is a really key point. Um, and it, it's actually an interesting bridge to this next point, which is actually the flip side of that. Um, that is what we'd like to call the captain's call. And what we see in there is that there is an internal over-reliance on we already know this. So right. that could be someone in the board or, or C-suite that says, we don't have to do this exercise. Or I'll do the exercise for you here in five minutes. Here are the five topics that are material. We already know this. And that then you're just basically avoiding the entire process and all those learnings, engagement, and really sitting down and thinking this through. So we've seen a you know, fair few companies that have said, we, we, know, we know our material topic. So that could be over reliance on that unilateral kind of internal selection of topics. We've got a list, or it can sometimes be, oh, we'll just look at what the industry is doing. And oh, if our two competitors are doing this, we'll do the exact same thing. So it's really making sure that you run through this and really think about your own entire value chain of, what are our business activities? And for each of those, what are the impacts, risks, and opportunities that we have? And then apply that materiality threshold lens on it. What is it then actually material? Talk to your stakeholders about that. So on, on this, Emmanuel, like, do you see till see this practice happening where there's companies that say, we already you know, done this, we know this? All the time, all the time. Yeah. I think usually where it comes from actually is yeah, there's a bit of, oh, well, we know this is going to be material to us. But it also comes in the topic selection process where a company might say, well, I don't think that's going to be material to us. Uh, I think water comes up as a risk like that sometimes to some companies that may not have a high water footprint where they say, do we really need to include water risk? I don't think that's going to be material to us. And my answer is always, that is exactly the purpose of this process. Great. If you think it's not material, Let's just put that to the test and confirm it for you so that next time an investor calls you and asks about what you're doing around water, you can, you know, say we actually did a materiality assessment. We found that that is not a top priority material topic to us. So while mm -hmm. we do measure our water use and find opportunities to reduce it, we're really focusing our sustainability program around these more material risks and opportunities. It allows for that validation to be able to speak to it more effectively. But um, we certainly 
have uh, a lot of, of companies kind of get ahead of themselves and forget that this process is exactly meant to give the evidence around what is or is not material based on those stakeholder views and other research and inputs. Yeah, good insights. Um, Wes, any thoughts on this, the captain's call? Yeah, on captain's call, um, I mean, if I think about how materiality assessments had been done and are still done in some unfortunate cases, um, it may involve engaging with no external stakeholders and with a very limited number of internal senior executives. And what's really unfortunate about that is that you're, what is important is to understand what matters most to some of your most influential external stakeholders. And you, you may be in this unfortunate scenario of you're just asking, you know, uh, uh, the IRO, for instance, or the comms or, or other colleagues, you know, so, you know, what do you believe are the topics that uh, would be considered, um, you know, significantly, uh, would be considered significant to, to, to different audiences. And the beauty that comes out of an exercise like this is that you are reaching out to external stakeholders and you're often providing information that our senior executives don't know, or at least why certain topics are important or perceptions of how well you're addressing certain areas. So, you know, making sure that you're able to reach out to external stakeholders and establishing that from the beginning. On the area of, um, I guess, external sources of information as well, like, yeah, we, we also have the scenario where some companies might want to just rely heavily on SASB to say, okay, we are this type of company, we fit into this SASB category. Um, can you just do a bit of peer research as well as refer to SASB and Bob's your uncle? Um, and and, and, and um, Bob's your uncle just means and we're done. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to that those sources of information can be tremendously helpful, especially at an early stage. Um, but it's just a question of how they're being used um, and that you're able to use all that you have at your disposal rather than, let's say, only using survey outcomes or only using these types of standards or only using a risk registry. It's, it's about thinking about how you can use each of these things and assigning a certain value or, or a use associated with them. So I think that that's really important here, the variety of data sources you use, where are you getting your information from? And just don't pick one, whether it be the industry standards or the survey results, but make sure that you have a really kind of diversified set of data points look at them, analyze them, give them a particular weighing, and then kind of use that to inform like what is that, you know, materi materiality list of topics and, and matters that, that really are important. Um, in, in doing that, so that's, that's I think, the, the next topic there is like, um, you know, all voices are equal. Sometimes people do have a few data sources, but they assume everything's the same. It's all, you know, weighed on the same level, but there are at times sources that are way more um, important than other sources. So how do you kind of work that into that assessment? How do you start thinking about like, are all voices equal? And we're not just talking about stakeholder voices, that is well there. Sometimes one group is more important than another group or way more participants. So you wanna weigh them down a little bit versus a much smaller group, but also there's other data points and sources that you have. Um, Wes, any thoughts on that? Like how to deal with that? You know, that's equality yeah, of voices. Yeah, where it says like all voices are equal, that should have a question mark after it, I think, because <laughs> it's an unpopular thing to say, but no, yeah. not all, all voices are equal. Um, there are some uh, stakeholder groups or organizations themselves that are more influential than others that carry greater weight. If, if there is an organization that owns 5% of your company, which is a lot, um, versus let's say a charitable organization that you partner with on a local initiative, those may be both organizations that are really worthwhile to engage with, to gain valuable feedback. But I think through, you know, and, and it's a big a bit of a plug to social suite, but you know, like through softwares like this, you're able to weight the value of different stakeholder groups into the equation and, and, and to be able to think about, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe that weighting might change based ultimately on your response rate. But rather than just having everybody lumped in into the same bucket, that, that really doesn't make sense. And it's not going to give you very good data. Um, you know, so, so I think that it is important to have that um, uncomfortable but real conversation early on about how we're going to engage with and weigh uh, different groups and just really leaning heavily on those high influence, high impact uh, kind, of, kind of stakeholder groups 
Um, and you know, I, I guess at the same time, you know, the the value of that data from stakeholders is value, but so is, as I mentioned before, how we might incorporate the topics that are raised from from other exercises like one's risk registry and, and even incorporating SASB. I'm going to jump to the next um, and final um, uh, final pitfall here, Emmanuel. I'm just looking at keep an eye on the time here. And so that final one, I think this is a little bit kind of circle round here. You know, tick box exercise there where you know, people just want to get it done and they make it really kind of operate in, um, in, in almost like in a vacuum, get, get it done. So how do you make, make sure that everyone fully understands that? Um, I think to your point that the exercise is only the starting point. So how do you get like really important things like executives and board around um, the, the notion that this is just not a compliance exercise this is something that really should help us set ambitious goals so to your earlier point like having that validation workshop how do you get people's heads around that and how do you start planning and making sure that you really maximize the value from your materiality assessment yeah i think earlier you know wes said that real a materiality assessment might take two to three months let's say that's the case in reality this entire process should be at least six months because yeah. there's a level of education and laying the groundwork and buy-in that needs to happen ahead of the assessment, really setting expectations, bringing everyone together, helping everybody understand what is this process? What are we trying to get out of it uh, to set yourself up for success for the process? And then, of course, in that, that end piece of what do we do with the findings now? I think this does really summarize everything that we've talked about throughout this conversation. But um, the other piece I would just add is, like everything with sustainability, this is a cross-functional uh, cross exercise. It requires input from all members across the organization. If we're engaging with suppliers, we need the help of supply chain and procurement. If we're engaging with customers, we need the help of sales or relationship managers. Uh, we need IR. We need We really need everybody to be on the same page. So um, really again, taking your time to ensure that everybody has their questions answered, feels comfortable with the process, understands what's expected of them as part of this process, helps for a really meaningful and impactful uh, impactful assessment that produces the results that you that you want in the end. That's a very good point. And I think that that is the key there is really making sure that from the start, everyone's on board and you're really driving that that, that internal education and, and, and often change management as well. If you've never done a materiality assessment or really getting everyone on board, it's, it's very important. So what we've done here is just like summarize what we've just gone through here on, on one slide. I'm gonna invite, while, while we look look at that, invite setback. I've gone a, a little bit over time there and I've seen there's a lot of questions. So I'll ask Seth to, uh, to join us and see if there's any particular questions we'll pick up now or uh, we might have to come back um, by email on uh, on some of those questions. Yeah, well, that that was great, everybody. Let's uh, let's jump into some of these questions. We've got a lot of questions. We'll take a few because we're coming up on time. Um, we'll start with a couple of the uh, reporting questions, and I'm going to start with um, start with uh, given we have our Canadian representative from West here, we did get a Canadian regulation question. So Wes, to the degree possible, if you could answer this, uh, the question is, um, there are three documents that were issued for public comment that will shape Canada's first sustainability standards. Mm -hmm. So how is double materiality, if at all, part of this process? And, um, you know, are there any changes as it relates to IFRS sustainability disclosure standards for use in Canada? It's difficult to give a 100% Correct answer to this because it, um, you know, based on conversations I've had with IFRS, for instance, which would be largely aligned with the CSSB, um, you know, while there's an emphasis on financial materiality, an aspect of double materiality is financial materiality. So you could choose to be able to, um, you know, based on doing a double materiality exercise, to be able to either lean directly in that one direction or to simply say, this is the result of our double materiality assessment, which you know, we think is, is relevant and gives a broader picture of, of what matters most and is what we are actually going to be planning on focusing on in our 10K 
in our proxy, in our sustainability reports, it's, it's, it's important to just be able to reconcile these areas so that you don't have two completely separate worlds that are going on. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't know if CSSB or ISSB for that matter would prescribe or require or even directly endorse double materiality. But I think that you know, informally they would they would support it um, as a as with with financial materiality being a, a component of it. Great, thanks, Wes. So we're going to take another. Uh, we got another reporting question here, um, and I'll pass this to Emmanuel. So the question is. How do you normally assess what sustainability reporting frameworks are best suited for a certain type of client? Yeah, I was I was going to mention this on one of the pitfalls around, you know, identifying uh, stakeholders, which is I think that in terms of how you weight your stakeholders and how you decide the best ways to report, it's all about looking at what is driving the organization's decision making and who are you trying to uh, communicate with. So in terms of what drives decision making, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with logistics companies where it's really about the customers. And at the end of the day, what the customers are asking for is what drives a lot. So that would be more of a heavily weighted uh, stakeholder as part of the materiality assessment. And then maybe, you know, reporting frameworks like Ecovatus, which is much more customer focused rather than the more investor focused reporting frameworks like a GRI, a SASB, a TCFD is the better route to go. So I think that process of deciding what reporting frameworks to, to disclose in line with, that stakeholder identification and prioritization process is crucial to that. If you're looking to communicate with only investors about financial materiality, SASB or TCFD might be best if you're looking to communicate with a broader range of, of stakeholders beyond just shareholders, GRI is, is a great reporting framework. So I think, again, looking at your stakeholders, prioritizing them has multiple purposes and uses in the front end of a materiality assessment and then in that piece about determining your reporting approach as well. I would just add to that, you know, fo first focus on what you're required to report to if there are different yes. regulations following that, maybe using the survey as an opportunity to be able to reach out to specific stakeholder groups to ask their insights um, as a way to look at what is voluntary. And then, and one additional point on that I'll say is the most important step all uh, in general, if you haven't started reporting yet, is to get started. And no matter which framework you use, as long as you're on that track and on a motion to getting started, that's what's most important. Um, all right, another question here, uh, which comes up a lot. This is related to the materiality assessment process. So we did get a question around, what is the minimum amount of stakeholder responses to be collected in order to um, go forward with your materiality assessment? And so maybe I'll start with uh, Wes on that. That's a hard question to answer. I mean, there's no, you should have at least 100 of this and 100 of that. Like, I think this is a judgment call and it, and it is more about making sure that you've engaged with the right folks rather than the number of folks. Um, you know, would, should you be happy with only having 10 internal and 10 external responses? Probably not. Um, um, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's about doing that mapping exercise at the beginning, identifying whether um, there is a reasonable representation of your company representing different uh, aspects of your business, business units, departments, regions, et cetera, and externally, whether or not you have your kind of tier one stakeholders that have been uh, engaged that they've provided a response. So I'm basically giving a non-answer to the question, um, but quality is better than quantity. I would agree. And the other piece I would just add is, I think this is where the weighting can come into play. Let Customers might be the most important stakeholder group, but if you only receive two customer responses to a survey and talk to one, should that be 30% of the overall weighting? Probably not. That's yeah, putting a changing. lot of weight on, yeah, exactly, just a few responses. So there is the ability to go back and kind of make sure that you're taking that limited response into consideration with the methodology that you apply for that weighting. Um, again, to not skew the results or put improper weight on on a few over the many that you might have gotten responses for around uh, employees, for example. So that's another 
and just another strategy of dealing with that because getting responses is hard. Getting responses from investors, especially difficult. They do not like responding to surveys. Um, they get a lot of them. They don't want to do them. So, you know, it's, it can be difficult to get the right, the right number of responses. So just updating the methodology accordingly to take out any potential bias there. Thanks, Emmanuel. All right, I know there are a few other questions. Um, we'll try to address them separately, but because we're running up on time, we are gonna wrap up here. Um, so again, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. Uh, the recording will be distributed to the attendees on the call. So um, please look out for that email after the fact. Um, otherwise, if you have any other questions related to materiality, sustainability, anything, Please feel free to reach out to Social Suite, myself, Tim. Um, you could also reach out to our panelists, Emmanuel and Wes. And I just want to say thank you again to our experts for joining today. And um, you know, appreciate it. And thank you again. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>